everybody, and welcome to The Beat, a news and informative talk program brought to you by the Center for Community Media here at Worcester State. I'm RJ Sheedy, and today we'll be taking a look at ballot question four. Question four on the ballot, if passed, will legalize the recreational use of marijuana here in Massachusetts while taxing and regulating the drug like alcohol. Joining us on set today are Will, is Will Luzier, the campaign manager for Yes on Four. But for now, we are joined by Representative Hannah Kane, who opposes question four. Representative Kane, thank you so much for being here with us today. Great to be here, thank you. So you are opposed to question four. If passed, what would question four to, and why exactly should a voter vote no on it? So question four, while it's written to, um, to indicate that it's to legalize recreational marijuana, what it's really all about is commercializing um, marijuana in Massachusetts. It's a 24-page ballot question. It was written by the marijuana industry for the marijuana industry. You didn't have other parties at the table who were a part of drafting this. And so those of us who are opposed, and it's a, it's a broad and, and deep coalition, um, including 121 of my colleagues in the House and Senate, very bipartisan, uh, were led on the opposition group by Governor Baker, as well as Speaker uh, Robert DeLeo and Boston Mayor Marty Walsh. Um, and we also have congressional support uh, from four of our congressmen as well to oppose the question. And really what binds us all together is not a philosophical objection to legalization. Um, what binds us together is the belief that this is not the right way to do it. Um, we believe that there are some significant issues that are unaddressed in this. Um, most people are unaware that marijuana today is uh, very different than it was just 20 years ago. So in my youth in indiscretion, uh, marijuana had two to 3% THC level. Today a joint can have anywhere between 17 and 20% THC. But more importantly, the edibles, which are over 50% of the sales in Colorado, one of the four states where it's legal, um, that THC level can be up to 95%. So it is a very different market than most people also assume it's going to be. Um, this ballot initiative has uh, no limits on the number of stores in Massachusetts. It has no limits on the potency of edibles. Um, it also um, allows people to grow at home. You can have 12 plants, which has up to a street value of up to about fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and the potential to grow at home 500 to 800 joints. We think that's an unreasonable amount to be home growing. Um, and you know, one of the reasons why you would look to do something like this would be to eliminate the black market. But what states like Colorado have found is that the black market has thrived. Um, so you know, there are some clear public policy issues that we think really need to be revisited, um, and we think that there should be more people at the table doing that. So you want to bring in. Um, you know, groups that both support and oppose this idea and really hear them out. And from that, you'll get the most uh, robust and responsible public policy piece. So I feel like there's a lot of support for question four, but, but you're saying this is not the answer. If you had your hands on the ballot and like, could have like, rewritten this however you want, mm -hmm. what would you have included in this to make it more, more of an ideal situation in your mind? Well, I think there's a number of things that are problematic in it. Um, one of the reasons that the Mass Municipal Association, which is the chief advocate for cities and towns, um, came out unanimously opposed to this is because it really strips away local controls. If you think about when we did casinos a few years ago in Massachusetts, we authorized those. Communities had to opt in, meaning they had to have an affirmative vote if they wanted to have a casino come into their community. The way that this ballot initiative is written is um, if your community doesn't want to take the mandatory minimum that the industry is requiring, then you have to have a referendum, a community-wide referendum, to not have that happen in your community. We think that's the wrong approach to this. Um, and primarily the reason that exists is the ballot initiative that was passed in Colorado uh, was very easy for cities and towns to retain control. And so immediately 70% of them opted not to have marijuana sales there. The industry didn't want to be locked out of that potential market in Massachusetts, so they made a high barrier for getting out of um, having marijuana businesses in your local municipality. Um, you know, obviously the edibles piece is concerning. Um, we think probably potency limits are important. We don't have any sort of long-term understanding of what highly potent edible products do to people um, over time, so we think it probably would have been much more prudent to look at having some sort of limits on that. Um, and as I, we're also deeply concerned about the drug driving. Washington State, which does not allow any home growing, um, despite that, in the first year after legalization, the number of marijuana-impaired traffic fatalities more than doubled. Um, and as you know, where somebody gets pulled over roadside and they've been drinking, we can detect that through the breathalyzer. It's an immediate impairment test. There is no test like that for marijuana impairment. You just look at them. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm just. So there are drug recognition experts in law enforcement who go, and that's a significant amount of training, and those are not people who are um, 
always going to be pulling people over. The other issue is, quite frankly, um, you have to have something that upholds in a court of law, and at this time, we do not have something. So simply looking at somebody does not pass muster in terms of whether or not a court is going to convict somebody based on drug driving. So, um, you know, we think that's a few years away in terms of development, and certainly that would be, um, you know, something that we would seek to have as well. But again, you know, there's only four states that have approved this, along with the District of Columbia. This is very early on in the process of um, legalization. And just last night on 60 Minutes, there was a piece, and the Colorado governor, who's a supporter of legalization, at the end of the piece remarked, any state thinking about legalizing should wait a few years and really use us as a laboratory and see what happens here and figure out what's the best way you know, to put together your public policy piece as you move forward. And you know, that's exactly what we're saying. We think it's too soon. We think that there's still more information that needs to be learned uh, before we move forward with this. So I want to go back to something that you said a few minutes ago. You sure. argued that um, voting yes will severely restrict the ability of cities and towns mm -hmm. to control the number of marijuana businesses, while your opponent, Will Luzier, wrote in the um, ballot mm -hmm. question saying that um, towns will have the ability to limit or ban marijuana businesses. As long as they have a community-wide referendum. So again. So the same thing, like, like in my town, when like Foxwoods was like almost going to come to Milford and set up shop, our town had, do you want a casino? Yes. Do you want one? No. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as that? Well, casinos had to opt in. So your community, in order for the casino to come there, your community had to affirmatively vote. It wanted it or could vote it didn't want it. In this case, marijuana businesses by right get to come into your community unless your community says, we don't want to take the mandatory minimum that's being required by this piece of ballot initiative. Again, you know, you can take the industry's perspective, which obviously they're a business, so they're not interested in being ruled out um, by any committee in town, or you can look at the Mass Municipal Association, which is the chief advocate for cities and towns, as well as the number of towns that have, uh, you know, voted to oppose this question. Um, you know, the mayors, uh, by and large, are opposed to this question because they uh, believe that it takes away the existing local authority that is there now. Um, and in, again, in Colorado, you have communities that are trying to repeal this right now. Um, because they are unhappy with what has happened inside of their communities relative to the impacts of the marijuana businesses. In Denver alone, there's over 454 marijuana businesses. In some communities, there's a marijuana business for one in every 47 residents. So when you have no sort of limit on uh, how many businesses are there, that's very impactful um, for these communities. Okay, so there's a really, really interesting ad out right now from the um, Campaign for a Safe and Healthy Massachusetts. It displays public smoking of the drug, it displays um, marijuana products in storefront windows, and it shows a child, you know, basically, uh, someone who looks like a child coming out of a pot mm, store. He's 21. Okay, he's 21. Do you view this, the public smoking and products in the storefront windows, do you view it as an accurate depiction? Of what uh, a yes, legal I do, and not only me. Uh, the day that that ad came out, the Yes on 4 also sent, put out their own ad depicting a doctor describing why it was necessary to have recreational marijuana approved for uh, uh, medical reasons. Um, and Channel 5 took a look at both ads and deemed ours true and deemed theirs false. So it's not just my opinion. Um, it's people who are looking at these ads and determining it's absolutely true. There's no limit on the number of marijuana businesses overall in the state. There's no limit that's set there. It's absolutely true that storefronts will certainly be able to advertise what they're selling in there. Um, and it's certainly true that um, you know, you will have to try and enforce not having smoking in public, but that's certainly something that people are going to be trying and doing. And, and quite frankly, you can use you don't an think e law enforcement will stop them from smoking? Because, I mean, it is no. literally written. No, you have you so? been down on the common during the cannabis uh, celebrations that they have? It is very difficult to totally control these things. The reality is today, though, I'm sure you know people who use e-cigarettes. Um, you can use e-cigarettes for marijuana as well, and no one can tell whether or not you're smoking in public. So, But the reality is, again, go back to the fact that over 50% of the sales in Colorado are in the edibles, the dabs, the oils. There are multiple ways in which you can consume marijuana, and some of them are very difficult. You know, If you're sitting here eating a candy that is a marijuana sprayed candy, I'm not going to know the difference when it's out of the packaging. Um, so certainly consumption in public is going to happen in theory in terms of this. But uh, yeah, our ad was deemed true by Channel 5 and those that have looked at it. Okay. All right, so marijuana sales could possibly generate $100 million in revenue for state and local governments. That's on a base, uh, that is based on the industry's projection 
that they can make this a $1.2 billion market in Massachusetts in 18 to 24 months. That is their $100 million. Um, when the Special Senate Committee took a look at this, they estimated it would probably be closer to $50 million, the market si based on the market size. But the reality is the tax rate that is built into this is the general fund tax rate we all pay on something, 6.25, which goes into the general fund. Then there's an excise tax of 3.75%, which would go to cover increased costs. Um, because this is a federally illegal drug, we don't have the EPA and the FDA to rely on, so we have to set up those uh, regulatory agencies inside of the state of Massachusetts. We also have to fund the Cannabis Control Commission, and we also need to fund increased use um, prevention. One of the things that's happened in the last 20 years is the perception of harm has dropped dramatically among youth in terms of how they perceive marijuana. So years ago, 80% of youth believed marijuana was harmful. Now that number's down the 30th percentile. So when you combine uh, the decreased perception of harm and you um, have increased availability and accessibility to marijuana, you have higher youth use, and that's why you see Colorado with the highest teen use in the nation. Um, so we would want to make sure that there are sufficient funds set aside to do additional education. Uh, and it's important to compare. Again, if you look at Colorado, the tax rate there is about 28% on marijuana. In Washington State, it's 44%. Um, and not only are their tax rates significantly higher, they also have a much larger tax base because they tax medical marijuana in those states. We do not tax medical marijuana in Massachusetts. So not only is the tax rate higher, but the tax base is larger. Um, so we believe that we will not have uh, sufficient funds to cover the increased cost of this. And you know, at the end of the day, it's a question, should taxpayers be subsidizing the marijuana industry? We certainly don't think that's the case. We don't do that for any other industry. Okay, so $50 million, that sounds like a lot of money. A voter hears that, and the voter's on the fence saying, should I vote yes, should I no vote no? And they hear they can get $50 million extra for the state. I'm sorry, yeah, $50 million extra for the state. That's what? revenue, you have to take away the cost now. So what I'm saying is that when you add the expense side in, it is not a $50 million bonanza. We're concerned that it's a ne negative number. Um, so that is what we're cautioning people, that this is not so a, a negative number? That is what we're concerned, yes, because you have to set up the regulatory environment. You have all these additional costs that you're not incurring today that you have to take on as a state. So our concern is that, no, there isn't going to be additional revenue. And again, if you look at the comparison between tax rates um, from the other states, the other states have been able to have a surplus tax revenue because after all those costs, because they're charging at a much higher tax rate and because they have a much larger tax base, they have revenues left. We're concerned we won't have revenues left here after the additional costs we must incur. If we were to have revenues afterwards and a voter hears that and they're on the fence of voting yes or no, why would you advise them to vote no when they ha hear the idea of getting extra money and we could potentially keep that out of the black market? Well, as I indicated to you before, the black market is thriving in other states that have legalized. Colorado has an enormous problem, um, and the states around them have an enormous problem because I mentioned the home growing. In Colorado, you can only home grow six plants. Three can be growing and three can be full size. Here, that number is 12. What's happening in Colorado, and again, I would ask anyone to look at the 60 Minutes piece that was done last night. You have an enormous number of illegal home grows going on where that is then being sold across the border in the other states, and they're doubling their money because no matter what you can sell it for in the state, you can double that or more when you go across borders where it's still an illegal drug. The governor of Vermont, Pete Shumlin, is a supporter of legalization. He's called this bill here a very bad pot bill. He's deeply concerned about what the impact is going to be on his state, particularly because of the huge allowance for home growing and because of the edibles. So our audience, as you probably know, is Worcester State students, faculty, and community. Mm -hmm. What is your final argument to them as to why they should vote no? Well, I would just uh, tell people that, again, this is not just a philosophical question. Um, we decriminalized in 2008. So right now, um, a person can have on um, up to an ounce of marijuana, which is around 50 joints. Uh, if they're caught, that's a civil offense, a $100 fine. So um, anyone who's um, using now and today you know, probably has access to it. Uh, we did medical marijuana in 2012, and we're in the midst of rolling that out. Um, this is really about the commercialization of the industry. So um, our perspective is, regardless of where you stand, even if you support legalization, we just believe this is not the means by which to do it. You don't want to take just the industry's perspective 
um, essentially take their business plan and give it a stamp of approval. We don't do that for any other industry. We work on legislation, we bring all parties to the table and we come up with um, what we believe would be the right way forward and that's what we think needs to happen here. We think we need to go back to the drawing board. We think we need to have the increased technology to be able to give law enforcement the tools that they need roadside to judge impairment and also courts to uphold that when it comes forward. Um, and we think we need to take a hard look at this edibles piece and you know, should there be some limits set around that um, to make sure that uh, what people are buying you know, isn't um, at a degree by which they're not understanding what they're purchasing and we have better information on what the long-term health effects are of that. Representative Kane, thank you so much for having Thank you for having me, appreciate it. Thank you, we'll be right back with Lil Luzier. Welcome back to the beat everybody. So we heard from the opposition of question four. Now it's time to hear from the campaign manager for Yes on Four. Joining me on set now is Will Luzier, the campaign manager for Yes on Four. Will, thank you so, so Thanks much. Thanks for having me, RJ. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for being here. So um, in your own words, explain to me what question four is and why a voter should vote yes on it. Well, um, question four will establish uh, the Cannabis Control Commission uh, appointed by the state treasurer, a three-member board that will regulate the sale uh, manufacture, cultivation, and testing of all marijuana and marijuana products. It will allow um, uh, limited personal possession for people over the age of 21, and it will establish um, several um, retail marijuana operations across the state. Okay, so I believe you were here during um, our last interview. You were hanging out in our green room, and Representative Kane gave a much different answer than what you just gave. What is your response to what she thinks this is? Well. Honestly, our opponents have been using um, a lot of um, scare tactics. Um, an example is the ad that they're running on TV. Um, there's a young girl who walks up to a marijuana store and looks in the window and sees marijuana products. The initiative says that there will be no public viewing of marijuana or marijuana products. There's, there's also, um, th they say that there will be thousands of uh, marijuana shops. Um, and uh, in fact, there are less than uh, 1,000 in all of Colorado, um, and uh, there are currently 178 applicants for um, medical marijuana facilities, and those are the folks who will be able to first transition from uh, medical marijuana use to adult sales. And so, uh, there w and, and the Cannabis Control Commission is also mandated to cap cultivation so that there won't be any more supply than there is demand. Now, how they're, how they're going to figure that out, I don't exactly know, but um, so there won't be thousands of marijuana shops in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, you know, we don't know exactly how many will, there will be, but um, a, a, an easy estimate is probably about 300. Okay, so, so we know on, based on the ad the opposition is running, we know their view of what legal cannabis market in Massachusetts would look like. What's your view on it? What do you think it will look like? Um, you know, these... Uh, stores will be standalone stores. They'll, um, uh, folks will uh, be carted on the way in so that they're, everyone uh, is assured that they're over the age of 21. And um, many folks who have gone to Colorado and come back, uh, there was an article recently in the uh, Globe um, by Arthur Schlesinger's son, um, and, and he said when he went, in, went to Colorado and went into a, a marijuana shop, it was like a high-end wine store. Um, and, and we believe that those, uh, that the marijuana shops in Massachusetts will um, be like that. Will legalizing marijuana harm our kids and families? We're just <laughs> as interested in making sure that youth don't use marijuana as uh, our opponents. That's why uh, there's no sales to folks over the age of 21. Um, uh, pardon me, the no sales to people under the age of 21. Um, no advertising that appeals to people under the age of 21, childproof packaging. You know, we're, we're uh, certainly interested in making sure that young people don't have access to marijuana, but I will tell you, moms and dads have come to us and said, um, I would uh, rather my 17-year-old son or daughter ask their older brother or sister um, or a friend to buy them marijuana in a regulated market where they know what they're getting, where everything is on the label, all of the uh, the constituents of the marijuana are on the label, and um, and they're not buying something that uh, they don't know what it is. So there will be mandated um, packaging, childproof packaging. Um, there's already um, 
regulations in Massachusetts in the Department of Public Health that say that you can't sell any candy that's um, that's uh, rec that, that's recognizable as a, um, a, a consumer uh, av consumer available candy. So we won't have gummy bears or uh, Swedish fish or gummy worms like our opponents say. Um, and also there are also regulations currently in effect that say you have to put large print on uh, the marijuana package that says keep out of reach of children. And honestly, we can't mandate parental responsibility. We just anticipate that um, the overwhelming majority of folks will uh, make sure that uh, their uh, marijuana products are safe and away from children and pets. So when it comes to setting up um, legal pot stores, your opposition says that a yes vote will restrict the ability of the cities and towns to control the number of marijuana retailers, while you argue that cities and towns can limit or ban marijuana businesses. So Which one is it? You can have a it vote. Because it sounds like you restricting and banning is as extensive as it can get. You can have a vote of the people. Uh, and uh, the, the reason that the Mass Municipal Association and that mayors have issues with this is because it takes the power away from them and puts the power in the voters. And so um, the problem, uh, and Representative Kane is a, is a state representative, and she knows, just as well as I know, that um, marijuana legalization bills have been filed in the legislature for uh, dozens of years, and they've done nothing with it. And so um, we need to take that, that decision, decision making away from the political leaders and put it in the hands of the people. And that's why the, this initiative is here. It's also important to remember that this is legislation, albeit legislation passed by the people. So um, the legislature can change the initiative at any time. And this is, um, the initiative is meant to push the legislature to take action on this issue because as you know, there was a recent Pew uh, uh, research st study that said that over 60% of the people across the United States favor the legalization of marijuana. And, you know, Representative Kane said it's not about legalization, it's about this bill. Well, um, they've not told us anything about why prohibition is so good. And so it's either this bill or prohibition. They can change it, they can change the tax rate, they can change anything they want to. And you know, they talk about bringing people together and, and um, hashing out these issues. They've had that opportunity for uh, ever since the legalization bills have been being filed and they haven't, uh, they've taken no action on it. So this is an opportunity to return the policy making to the voters. Do you think that was a long answer to your short question. No, no, I, I like <laughs> the long answer. So do you think, so a lot of people hear marijuana and they think bad things about it. They think it's a dangerous, really bad drug. In fact, marijuana is in Schedule 1 on the DEA, classified with heroin, cocaine. Do you think that's a fair representation of, of, of it to be listed with those much more powerful, potent drugs that can actually kill you? When you look at the history of the prohibition of marijuana, uh, you first have to look at a guy named Harry Anslinger, who was the head of the uh, analog of the Drug Enforcement Administration in the federal government in the 30s. Harry was about to lose his job because uh, alcohol prohibition was ending and he needed to protect his organization and protect his job. So he started demonizing Mexicans who were coming across the border with marijuana. Um, in fact, they changed the name of the popular name of marijuana from cannabis to marijuana to make it sound more menacing or Spanish. Um, and then they started demonizing jazz musicians um, and uh, and so the bedrock of the history of prohibition was racism. Um, and fast forward to Richard Nixon in the, uh, the early 70s. Um, uh, there's a famous uh, quote from um, John Ehrlichman who said, uh, the pro we had problems with black folks and hippies in the 70s. And uh, so we knew we couldn't make it against the law to be black or to be against the war. And so what we knew we could do was to make it against the law to have marijuana. And so um, he said that way we could rouse their meetings, uh, invade their homes, uh, and make their lives miserable. He said, did, you know, did we know we were lying about the drug? He said, absolutely we did. So that's where the Schedule I came from. That's, where, uh, that's why marijuana is um, 
you know, the federal government considers the, the equivalent of heroin. And, and that's just, I mean, it's, a, it, it's um, a history replete with racism. So you, so one of the great things about legalizing this is that it brings it out of the black market into a state controlled commission that can then tax it and maybe generate 100 million in revenue for state and local governments. Um, how exactly will the tax the, will the tax on the product work, and where will this extra money go? And will there be extra money? Because Representative Cain says they won't be, or they could not be. Um, Andrew Friedman, who is the um, director of the marijuana program in Colorado, was in uh, town a couple of weeks ago, and he said that um, they uh, collected 135 million dollars in revenue last year in Colorado, and the uh, marijuana, the entire marijuana program, cost them 25 million. So they had 110 million dollars left over. Um, the ArcView report that came out in March um, said that in year three, uh, if this initiative passes, that the, um, the revenue will be a, a billion dollars, which translates into about $100 million in tax revenue. And that's just the tax revenue from the 6.25% sales tax, which will go into the general fund, the 3.75% excise tax, which will go to fund the marijuana regulation fund and fund the activities of the Cannabis Control Commission, and anything that's left over from that will also go into the general fund. And then there's an optional 2% tax for localities um, to, uh, they will get 2% of any retail sales for any businesses that locate in their city or town. So um, we believe that, here's an example, the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission um, budget for last, for this year and this year's budget was $2.2 million and they're regulating over 2,000 alcohol establishments across the state. So we believe that the, the $37.5 million that will come um, to uh, the Marijuana Regulation Fund will be more than enough to fund the activities of the Cannabis Control Commission. A lot of people are kind of concerned about health, um, health consequences of legalizing marijuana. Is there anything that could jeopardize people's health from using it? Is it as dangerous as the opposition makes it seem? Actually, it's not. Um, you know, th there's a study of, out of Great Britain that says that alcohol is 114 times more dangerous than marijuana. Um, and we believe, and we believe that there's science to back it up, that um, the opioid crisis could be eased by legalizing marijuana. Here's an example. Um, there was a, a Journal of the American Medical Association study from 2014 that said that um, in states that have full-blown medical marijuana programs, there is a 25% uh, decrease in the amount of uh, opioid overdose deaths in those states. And the longer they've had a medical program, the, the more those deaths decrease. So, uh, and there's also uh, some scientific evidence. There was a, 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 a Journal of Pain um, article that came out in 2016 that said that for people that are allowed to use marijuana while they're uh, using pain medication, their reliance on the pain medication was reduced by 46%. And so um, we believe that folks can use marijuana medically. Um, and in fact, uh, there are some folks who need marijuana medically who can't get it through the current medical marijuana system um, because they're too far from the dispensaries or because they don't want to go on the DPH list because they might be undocumented immigrants or they might be veterans who are afraid to lose their veterans benefits or federal employees or retirees or um, so many people who don't want to go on that list and they will be able to get that medicine and be able to um, ad have it administered uh, on advice of their doctors with and cut out the DPH middleman and not have to ex uh, expend the uh, money of uh, getting a medical marijuana card which can be expensive if you need to pay a doctor to get a certification. So we're almost out of time. Um, before we leave, um, the, the majority of our audience here is Worcester State community, faculties, um, students, staff. What is your final message to them as to why they should consider voting yes on this question? Uh, as I said before, there are between 800,000 and a million people that use marijuana on a regular basis in Massachusetts. Um, and they're being forced into a market where they're buying a product, they don't know what it is, um, they're not asked for their IDs, uh, those people who are selling the marijuana could have uh, drugs that are much more dangerous than marijuana, including heroin. And so what we need to do is take that uh, commerce out of the criminal market and put it in a regulated market that pays taxes, 
creates jobs, uh, drives down youth access, and um, it, it's a public health um, issue, it's a consumer protection issue, it's a criminal justice issue, um, and we j just need to make sure that the government stops telling people uh, that uh, they can't use something that's far less dangerous than alcohol. Will Luzier, thank you so much Thanks, for RG. spending the appreciate, afternoon appreciate with it. us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here with us and watching the program. That's all for today. Remember, Election Day is on November 8th, so make sure you get out there and vote. Reporting for The Beat, I'm RJ Sheedy. So long, everybody.